on to our second half. So now we're going to look at register beginning with informal language. Remember I said register is a spectrum, almost no text, not uh, all of them, um, are completely formal or completely informal. So try to stand out, especially in your ACs, by um, for every formal text, find an informal feature or two. For every formal, uh, for every informal text, find a formal feature or two, if possible. Sometimes it won't be. Um, and don't be too definitive when defining the register. Um, so for the features we look at for informal language, note that these relate to the meta language that we've just covered and gone through. Um, in terms of phonetics and phonology, uh, we looked at connected speech processes and phonological patterning. Um, these um, uh, everything that falls under these umbrella terms is more often related to informal features. So you can use these to show that the register is informal and analyze why those features are there and how they reinforce register. Um, so for connected speech processes, for instance, relaxed pronunciation might be shown through non-standard spelling. You call spelling orthography as well in English language. So that's another word I would add to your vocab list. Um, so it shows relaxed pronunciation if we have non-standard orthography. Connected speech processes are also casual and they lower formality and they help to build rapport. Um, in terms of phonological patterning, if it can be linked to amusing or persuading functions um, and the social purpose of building rapport, all of these things associated with informal register more so. For morphology and lexicology, if you think a text is informal, look for and analyze slang and colloquial language, informal language and slang terms. Look for Australian suffixation, those double consonants, i.e. O endings. Um, Australian suffixation shows that a text is casual and formal and there's a relaxed, uh, relaxed relationship between the interlocutors, if you can spot it. Um, it also builds rapport and promotes a sense of national identity and belonging. Um, Look, look for neologisms, those new words and any of those creative word formations as well that we've looked at. It makes a text engaging and playful. For syntax, uh, expect that there will be all types of sentence uh, structures, okay? But if a text is truly informal and it hasn't been planned, which we're looking for, uh, expect there to be more simple sentence structures with only one clause um, because it isn't planned so we'd expect to see less sentences simply look also for sentence fragments it's likely to be a bit more sentence fragments in an informal text for semantics look for all the types of semantic patterning that we've just looked at it might be doing something like creating humor through a pun um, creating entertaining or funny descriptions through things like a simile, okay? Using those cliche sayings, those idioms. Um, and we can connect that to informal language as well. There may also be more taboo language. Haven't looked at taboo today, but it's all those topics that are controversial to mention in society. Imagine there's a relaxed relationship, close relationship between the interlocutors. Um, and they feel comfortable enough simply so they can say what's on their mind without fearing that it's going to cause offense so they can bridge those taboo topics for discourse um looking at the features of spoken discourse we're mainly looking for any sign that the text is not planned that's what informal language is all about it should be not planned um, so things like pauses and false starts could signal nervousness or someone's just collecting their thoughts, indicating a text is informal, maybe non-fluency features, stammering, stopping a sentence, starting it again, overlapping speech, interruptions, each person is talking over the other because they're relaxed and they won't take offense if they interrupt, things like that. 
Now, the formal features that you want to look for are everything that's the opposite of what we've looked at, okay? Um, but I've still created a more comprehensive list for everyone. <clears throat> so elevated lexis, also known as our big fancy words, longer words with more syllables and fancy sounds, those nominalizations, those nouny words, when we take a verb and change it into a noun, uh, making it sound longer and fancier and stick it at the start of a sentence. Passive construction. So remember back to our passive voice and our agent list passive. Um, sophisticated syntactic structures. There'll be more longer sentences and more complex sentence structures such as our compound complex, for instance. Planned patterning. Any indication that a text is planned is what you want to look for. So literally look for a lack of these things, you know, an indication, a lack of pauses, false starts. You can analyze a pause that appears to have been intentionally done to create emphasis as a formal feature because that indicates, oh, this speech was planned. This person made um, a really clearly planned pause to draw emphasis to an idea, for instance. So anything that indicates planned patterning, whether that's phonological features, lexical features, or syntactic features. Um, look for jargon. Jargon is the language sort of used in a specific field or a domain. So for example, if you work in a certain career, you might know lots of jargon terms, lots of words that only people um, involved in that field really use. As an English language student, you have jargon pertaining to English language and you hope to build that up over this year. Look for conventional formatting, especially if the text is in the written mode and it's printed rather than just a transcript of a speech. Look to see that it follows conventional standard formatting expected for that text type and it's neat and tidy. And you would expect high levels of cohesion and coherence that we just looked at. Heaps of logical ordering. Everything flows in a manner that makes sense. Uh, we're not jumping from idea to idea. 